Well, shalom and welcome back to the house, the family, and the piece of land. Some of you have already noticed over time here that I pretty much go about 150 miles an hour, so we got a lot of stuff to continue uh, to cover here, so no fluff in the beginning. Let's just get right back in to where we were when we left off last time. We were talking about uh, the meaning of the word paths of righteousness, for example, in Mizmor or Psalm 23, verse 3, agol. And we're talking about some of the meanings of that. And this psych, uh, we were discussing God's cycles, or, uh, and the fact that God's righteousness is found in those cycles from the very beginning. Now, why is that it's important to grasp? Because that's the nature of a father. That's the way we are supposed to teach our children. I, I, I think I've spoken before about how it's my belief that the most important characteristic of our Creator is not Yahweh, and it's not Adonai, and it's not El Shaddai, and not Elohim, and so on and so forth. It's Papa. It's Abba. It's, it's father, Av, in the Hebrew. Why? Well, because that's the one that we can relate to the most. And that's why it's so important that we be good earthly fathers, because many times we're representing that father to the world. And so we can relate to a father. And that's the way fathers and mothers are designed to teach kids. We teach them over and over. We're constantly looking for examples to teach our kids lessons. How many times have you said to your children, how many times have I told you that? That's because that's the way fathers are designed to teach. It's in a natural picture, once again, of a house, a family, and a piece of land. And so we've been talking about this word, agol, ayin, gimel, lamed. And we were in Yaakov, or James, in your English Bibles, chapter 3. And I was talking about the fact that, that chapter 3, verse 1, starts out by giving a warning to those who are teaching. Why? Because when people teach, it's words that come out of our mouth. It's words. And so now he's going to go right to the tongue. In Yaakov chapter 3, verse 2, he says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man is able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths so they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships and the rudders and so forth. And then when you get down to verse 5, it says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now the point of this, once again, is not, he's not, Paul's not talking about the physical, I mean Yaakov, is not talking about the physical tongue here. He's talking about the words, the teaching especially, that comes out of our mouths. And the Father already knew from the beginning that His own people would corrupt His ways. And that's why the prophets are filled with the corruption that would take place even in the, in the latter times. And so the Father told us and prophesied that in the latter days, I will restore all these things back. I will restore, I will redeem, and, uh, and return. All those words are used, especially of Elijah's ministry. And so he goes on in verse 6, and he says, And the tongue, or the words, is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body, and is set on fire of hell. Excuse me, it sets on fire the course of nature. Now, if we can bring up back on the screen what we have there right now. There's James chapter 3, verse 6. On your screen, it says, and the tongue is a fire. Can we put it on? Oh, it is there. Oh, it's just a different color. Okay. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Hey, we're all family here. And the tongue is among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire. Notice this phrase, course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So Yaakov here is very serious about what's written here. He says it sets on fire the course of nature. Now, that English phrase, course of nature, in the Hebrew, is this phrase right here. Course of nature. In Greek, it says, ton trakon tes genesios. Ton trakon tes genesios. Can we put it up on the screen here? Literally, it's the cycle of Genesis. Ton trakon tes genesios in the Greek here. I don't even need to take it back to the Hebrew. The cycle or wheel, because trakon, trakon in, in Greek is the word for Wheel. It's the same word used in Ezekiel's wheel, in Ezekiel chapter 1. And that is ophan in the Hebrew. The word for wheel or, and, and cycle here, as in a, a bicycle wheel or a chariot wheel, is ophan in, in, in the Hebrew. And so we get, as a matter of fact, we get our English word fan. The English word fan comes from the Hebrew word of ofan. Why? Because if you, see, if you look at a fan, it's making a cycle. A real fast cycle, but it's making a cycle. And so these words Yaakov is teaching here 
are going to destroy. The phrase set on fire is not a good phrase. Set on fire the wheel or cycle of Genesis. So one might ask, well, what in the world is the cycle of Genesis? Well, I hate to do some shameless promotion here, but I have a series called Ezekiel's Wheel in which I go into the details of that. But suffice it to say, God establishes his cycles in the very beginning. And it's his cycles that he placed his righteousness in from the very beginning. And so in the beginning, he says, these things are not only good, but very good. And then he says, now go forth and multiply once again. Very simple principles that I don't think we quite take them to, to the, the full meaning of what God meant for, for, them to, for them to be in the beginning because he is consistent with those principles all the way to the end. Like kind begets like kind. I, ever did, I already did everything that needs to be done with all my creation in the beginning. I made it good and not only good, but very good. And now I've designed it to where you go forth and you multiply after yourself. Well, somewhere halfway in between, the whole evolutionary process uh, took over. And we started doing something totally different than we did at the very beginning. And then we wonder why we have these problems. Now, this word, our goal, is uh, ayin, gimel, lamed. But it's based on the word gimel and lamed. Here's another example on your screen right now. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says this. Ponder the path, now there's that linear term in English, but in Hebrew it's cycles of your feet. Let all your way. Now notice the word feet because the gimel is, the, is represented by the foot in Hebrew, the, the letter gimel, the G sound. Let all your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Now how do you remove your foot from evil? By pondering my cycles. That's how you do that. You ponder my cycles, not your own. So you don't turn to the right, and you don't turn to the left. You stay on my cycles, and you do it my way. Now this word, uh, our goal, is made up of the gimel and the laban. Now let's go to the board, because I've already drawn some stuff here on the board for you that are the root of this, or the root of this word. And so the word gimel and laman which is the base of calf and the base of these cycles, is a G and an L. It means a cycle or to roll. This is what it looks like pictographically. The gimel is represented by a foot. That's the G. And the, and the shepherd's staff represents the lamed. That's the basis of this word right here. Every time this letter changes, it's going to change all the nuances of what the word means. But every single Hebrew word that has a gimel and a lamed in it has something to do with rolling or making a cycle. Gilgal and words like that. And I've given you a couple of examples here on the board because the idea is a foot and leading. And God's ways are his cycles. All right? So our foot or our walk how we walk and how we are led is either by God's cycles or our own. And the, the picture of us going unto our own ways is in the calf worship when they come out of, out of Egypt. And I submit to you over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, God's people are always going to wander away from his ways and do it their own. And the Father's constantly having to bring us back to his ways from beginning to end. Aren't you, aren't you glad that we have a loving father and creator who every time we fall, he's willing to pick us back up? He's got a lot of patience. If I was God, I would have zapped you guys out a long time ago. There wouldn't be a single person left on the face of the earth, including me. I'd be gone too. But he's a loving, patient father. And he's constantly seeing us fall down and he picks us back up. And we've been doing the same thing for 2,000 years as well. I've given you some other examples of this word. For example, gala in Hebrew, G-A-L-A-H, gala, which is where we get the word galut from, which is the Hebrew concept of the exile, the galut, the dispersion out into the nations. It's made up of this G and this L. Now, if you actually, literally, this word means to expose. Gala means to expose or reveal something. It's translated to reveal and to expose. And so the idea of the exile, the casting out of his people, of Israel, out to mix among the nations, is that if they would have stayed under his wings, he would have protected them just like Adam in the garden. He would have watched over them and taken care of them. 
But since they wanted to go there, do their own thing, like the prodigal son, because they, and then they got scattered throughout all the world and mixed with the other nations, now they're exposed to the same elements that all the nations are. The same heat, the same desert, the same dry wilderness. That's why the pattern of Adam in the garden. He's going to be the pattern for, for this constant exile. Uh, God gives his commandments. We turn away from them. He brings us back and restores us and redeems us. We turn away from his commandments. He brings us back and restores us. This constant picture of man being cast out into the wilderness to compete with the rest of the world for his bread is Adam being exiled out of the garden. What does it say? What's the earth going to produce for Adam now? Thorns and thistles, as opposed to a beautiful garden with tomatoes and peppers and lemons and kumquats, whatever those are, okay? And he would have had that, but no, he had to do it his own way. And so the, the whole idea of this is to expose. Now, what does that mean? What does that have to do with a G and an L? Well, let me explain it to you. The picture of rolling is the picture of taking something, a, a large rock on the ground and rolling it over because as you can see, this is like a pebble or a stone. And you roll it over and when you do it, you expose what was underneath it. How many of you have done that? How many of you walked through the woods and so forth and seen a rock on the ground and taken your foot or something, or hand, and picked up that rock and rolled it over. And as soon as you do, boy, if there's, there's a bunch of bugs and spiders and stuff, and they're running all over the place. Why? Well, they're in this nice place that we'd like to be, the darkness, and now you've exposed them to the light. Expose. Okay? And they don't like that. So the idea of exposing in Hebrew is related to a rolling something. This really all does make sense when you begin to put these beautiful pictures together. They're natural things that we do all the time. We don't have to throw them into a sea of abstractness. If we take them back, they're very simplistic little things in the beginning. It's man that's made a mess out of it. As a matter of fact, I remember several years ago doing, doing a conference or a seminar somewhere, and, and in between the sessions, a man walks up to me. Very tall, lanky man wearing coveralls. I think he was in his early 70s. He was wearing coveralls and he had a straw hat on. I mean, he had everything but the corn cob pipe. And he walks up to me. Here's what he says. He says, Brad, he says, I'm just a simple man. He says, I don't understand all this parsing and conjugating and all kind of stuff. I don't understand. I'm just a simple man. And I turned to that guy and I said, well, then you're the one that's going to get it, sir. You're the one that's going to get it. Because I, I, I know I overuse this word, but once again, it's pinheaded intellectualism that's been the biggest part of the problem of the chaos, theologically, religiously, whatever you want to, word you want to use in our culture. I believe that the Father today is saying something very simple to you and me. And it's in the parable of the prodigal son. He's saying simply these two words. Come home. Go back home. Go back to the house and the family and the piece of land. You've wandered off and you've made a big complicated mess because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, the Messiah said. He says, my commandments in, in 1 John are not burdensome. Man has made them burdensome. And mostly because we don't, most men don't even know what the commandments are, but they are the guide and the blessings for our life. The commandments have never been our salvation. They've always been our blessing. And when we get to the Hebrew word yara, which is the root of Torah, here in the next couple of sessions, you're going to see why God displayed the teaching that it's for by grace, through faith that you are saved, that not of yourselves, in the meaning of the word for law, that we translate as law in English in the Hebrew. And you're going to see that beautiful picture when we get to it. But meanwhile, uh, galah is from this root, the gimel and the lament, to roll over, to expose goel. Boaz, the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer, the story that you've heard all about in the book of Ruth, is translated as redeemed, but once again, that's an abstract word. And when you take it back to its simple little picture, to bring back around. The, the, the picture is shown in rolling the stone over and then rolling the stone to bring something around because God operates in cycles. So he's bringing you back redeeming is the abstract word, but the picture is actually of a cycle. Coming back to the same place uh, that you started up. Gil, the Hebrew word gil, means to dance in a circle. 
It's tra- it's in, 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 in Hebrew, it means also, not just to dance in a circle, but if I, had, if I had something here to do it with, I'd show you. We'd probably get a little dramatic, and I'd probably bust the microphone. But literally, this word gil in Hebrew, which is used when Yeshua uh, rejoices. There's, there's, I believe it's in Luke chapter 10, verse 22. It says, Yeshua rejoices in the Spirit. Literally, that means he jumped up in the air. Literally jumped up in the air and spun around and landed. I mean, he did something. He just didn't rejoice in his heart. He didn't stand there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing in my heart. No, he literally got up and danced in a circle. Luke chapter 10, verse 22. So that's, a, that's the basis of Gil. Megillah. Some of you are probably familiar with Megillah. That is the Hebrew word for a scroll. A scroll. Why? Because scrolls, you roll up and unroll. You roll them in and you roll them out. So that's the Hebrew word for a scroll. So can you see the G and the L in the midst of that word? This just puts, in the, the mem just puts it as a noun and the, and, the, and, the, and the feminine ending there, but it is a scroll that's being talked about here. And it just so happens that this scroll the way a scroll is designed immediately follows the teaching of Ezekiel's wheel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it teaches us a vision of a wheel within a wheel. A cycle within a cycle. A faster cycle, a yearly cycle, and then a life cycle on the outside. And because he knew that, he, that his people, house of Israel, would be scattered unto the nations and mixed with all their ways and, and, and do, end up doing calf worship and so forth and establishing their own cycles, he tells Ezekiel to take this image, which is a beautiful picture of the Messiah himself, because remember, it's the image of a man. Now within that man is four faces which is a perfect picture of not only the four Gospels and not only the four camps surrounding Israel, but a perfect picture of, the, of, of what we call in Hebrew the Bashat, the Ramez, the Drash, and the Sod. Those are the four levels of Hebrew interpretation that I think we've uh, glossed over in the past for a little bit. But every verse in the Bible has those four levels. Every, I'll say it again. Every verse in your Bible has all four of those levels of interpretation. Why? Because unless you understand all four, you will not get a full view and a full picture of what any verse means. So in every verse in the Bible, we look for the Peshat, the Remez, the Drash, and the Sod. Why do we look for those? Because if we incorporate all four, we have a full picture of what the verse is saying. And so there's four faces in that, is in, in that wheel, within a wheel. And those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you only look at who the Messiah is through Mark... You're not getting the full view of who the Messiah is. If you only look at John, which is the sowed, then you're only getting a, mis- a mysterious view or a hidden view of the Messiah. You have to have all four Gospels to, under- to get a full view of who Yeshua the Messiah is. And that's the teaching of the Peshat, the Ramez, the Jerash, and the Sod, and it's all in Ezekiel's wheel as, as well. And so if you read Ezekiel's wheel in, in Genesis chapter, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, He finishes it by saying this, take this vision to the rebellious house of Israel. That's Ezekiel chapter 1 or 2 verses 1 and 2. Take this vision to the rebellious house of Israel. The rebellious house of Israel was represented by Ephraim whose symbol was a calf. Which means to make a cycle. And so they, they would establish their own calf worship, their own cycles, their own yearly cycles. And you know what those are. Okay, here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus. Okay, whatever. We establish their own cycles, and God's constantly having to reach out to his people and say, no, 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 no. I established my ways in the beginning, and I told you to go forth and multiply after yourselves like kind. So I've got to restore these cycles back unto you. I've got to restore my ways, my statutes, my ordinances, my Shabbat, my appointed times back to my people in the latter days. And so he t- says, take that to Ephraim, if you will, or Samaria or, the, or Joseph, all same words for the house of Israel. And then he follows it by talking about a scroll written within and without in the front and the back of a scroll. Scrolls contain what? Words. And that's one of the reasons why Hosea said in chapter 14, we quoted earlier, that when you turn from your iniquities 
and you return back to Yahweh, he says, take with you words when you turn back to Yahweh. And I submit to you that's one of the reasons why this beautiful language that began things in the beginning, that's very pictographic, very concrete, all has meaning in a house, a family, and the piece of land, he's going to restore back in the latter days so we can return back to the house the same way the prodigal son did in the parable to go back to the house and that's all understood in these simple uh, principles now I submit to you once again that if we do things cyclically the way it's designed is, is if there's a tree right here and we keep God's ways then we pass by that tree every time we keep his ways every time we keep his cycles and do it his way we pass by this tree if we were if we think like Greeks Linear thinking, we pass by the tree and we went on to the next thing. But, but the way God established his cycles in the beginning is so we could be taught the same thing over and over and over again. So we would establish a little trench, a little track in the ground so we would do things naturally. And he also designed it to where if there's something in that tree, like there's a little something sitting on the branch here, if we, if we keep his cycles... One of these days, we see something on that branch we never saw before. We never saw before. How many of you in your life have read your scriptures over and over and over again? And then one day, you see something in a verse, and you say to yourself, you know, I've read that verse a hundred times, and I never saw that ever before. See, if you do it things God's ways, He gives you opportunity after opportunity to see it. If you think like man does, on to the next thing, as we evolve and progress and so forth. You wouldn't have seen it. But God's way, you'll see it, see it every time. I submit to you that what the Father is trying to say in these latter days is this is the way I teach all of my word. In all of these things from the very first word, not just the very first chapter, not just the very first book of the scripture, but from the very, very first word of scripture, God has been teaching us the same things over and over and over again. So then in the end of time, we will stand before God with no excuse. That's the point. Okay, we're talking about these cycles. Now we're going to go on to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, we have the following phrase, and then we'll, we'll finish up with this, uh, uh, this verse in Ezekiel uh, 37, 16, and 17, and then we'll come back to this on our next show. It says, Moreover, you son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it. For Joseph, remember that the stick of Ephraim, for the house of Israel, his companions. And once again, Joseph and Ephraim and Samaria all speak of the ten tribes. And it says, join them one to another, <coughs> excuse me, into one stick, for they shall become one in your hand. Now I'm going to read it again very slowly this time. Moreover, son of man, take thee one stick. That word stick in the English, in Hebrew is eights. The Hebrew word for a tree, eights. It's translated as a stick, but it's literally the Hebrew word for a tree. So we're going to see two trees here, made one, and then we're going to go to Romans, and we're going to see two trees that are going to be grafted into one tree. And in the beginning of Genesis, we start with one, two trees in the garden. And then when we read the book of Revelation at the end, guess what? There's only one tree. So we have one tree in the beginning, one tree in the end. One house in the beginning, one house in the end. One person in the beginning, one person in the end. One land in the beginning, one land in the end. One language in the beginning, one language in the end. And then he says, take that tree, write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. We're going to investigate uh, next time this word companions. Then take another tree and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So Joseph and Ephraim represent the house of Israel, which happens to be one entity in the covenant. And the other stick, Judah, represents the other tree or the other entity in the new covenant. Remember, Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah chapter 31, 31, tells us, repeated in Hebrews chapter 8, that the new covenant, technically in Hebrew, the renewed or restored covenant. Remember the whole concept of those R words? Going back 
to the way it came. See, the reason why that word renewed there is used is because that's the Hebrew word that's used for the moon, the phases of the moon. The moon starts out as a new moon, goes through its phases, and comes back to what? Where it began. And that constant picture every month of seeing the new moon go through its phases up to, a, uh, you know, waxing into a full moon and then waning back to a new moon every month is God constantly teaching you. See how that works? That's my, how my word was designed in the very first place. But you all have changed it and you've corrupted and you've established your own cycles and you didn't stay with mine. And so these pictures are shown over and over and over in the renewed covenant, the picture of the moon, I will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He's going to restore something that was once one, divided because of sin, and then he's going to bring them back to that one house with one shepherd, one fold, and one shepherd over the fold. That's exactly what John chapter 10 verse uh, uh, John chapter 10 teaches is that the purpose of the death and resurrection of the Messiah according to John chapter 10 was to make of two one fold with one shepherd. That's the whole purpose of the death and resurrection of the Messiah. And it's clearly seen in these words. And we're going to take these words companion back and see what they mean as well next time I'm with you. So in the meantime, cling to your roots that your days may be long and you will prosper in everything you set your hand to do. Shalom and Lincoln.